Hello everyone, this is Felix Konomakis, uh, specialist in ARFID. Today I'm uh, doing a little video just to answer the question, do I have ARFID? Something that's being asked on my forums quite a lot. So the definitive place to check for symptoms of this would be something called the DSM-5, the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic Statistical Manual, fifth edition. And ARFID is very much in there. And it's got some symptoms which I'll, uh, criteria I'll read out. Um, when a lot of people, doctors and eating disorder specialists, don't believe ARFID is a real thing, think it's a kind of anorexia or autism or something, uh, it, it's in the DSM-5, you know, it's there as, as much as OCD. You know, people wouldn't say, I don't believe OCD exists. Uh, it, it's, it's there. So in terms of DSM-5, the defining characteristics are, let's have a look. There are, there are many types of eating problems that might warrant an ARFID diagnosis. Difficulty digesting certain food, avoiding certain colors, textures of food more common, eating only very small portions also common, having no appetite or being afraid to eat after a frightening episode of choking or vomiting. That's the most common version. Um, talks about eating disturbances, restrictions, avoidance, significant weight loss. The opposite can happen as well. Weight gain because of a carby, high fatty diet. Um, nutritional deficiency as a result. And this disturbance is not better explained by lack of available food or by an associated culturally sanctioned practice. That's quite important. So some other things there, I'll put them on the link. So in, in one way, this can be quite easy to diagnose. If you were to say to me, I'm really afraid of spiders and I can't relax in the garden. I'm afraid a spider might be there. I'm always on the lookout so I don't go in the garden. I don't think it's rocket science. This is arachnophobia. You have a phobia of spiders or could be cats or dogs. Now the same thing with food. If you'd like to eat food but you're afraid of something bad will happen. Um, choking, um, gagging, vomiting are the common ones but occasionally it's been so long for some people that they'll say to me I don't I don't know what I'm afraid of. I, I don't think I'll gag or vomit but there's just like a block, a mental block. Well, yeah, because the fear, it, it's been present for so long, people have forgotten why they're originally afraid of it. But in any case, the idea is, I'd like to eat some food, there's a block in the way, and I can't eat it. That's my rule of thumb, that's our fit. So if, you'd, if you feel you have those criteria, very simply put, that would be our fit. And the, the next best thing would be people say, you know, how do I uh, go on a date and eat, basically deceive my date or my colleagues at work and I'm just thinking well the most simple effective thing to do would be to get effective help from someone who knows what they're doing because then you treat the original problem and all the secondary and tertiary problems that they they will clear up it's not the solution not to get really good at avoidance and deception and um, you know, finding ways around it that's a lot more energy than just addressing the original problem Here's the thing on sensory processing disorder. Uh, this is a real thing. It's hard to figure out exactly what the proportion of clients are for that. Perhaps 30%. And it's not scientific, that's a sort of top of my head figure of people I see. So sensory processing is when people experience taste more intensely. So even if they're not afraid to experience with food, they might say it still tastes a bit too intense, too bitter, too sour, too this. And that is an actual challenge. Um, and so all I can do with that is by removing as much anticipatory uh, anxiety and expectation as possible to make it as easy as possible to eat food, to make food as neutral uh, a tasting experience as possible. And by waking up the taste buds, the hope is that food will gradually get better. But I can't lie to you, it is more challenging with genuine sensory processing. But it's important to remember a lot of people they do get an SPD diagnosis incorrectly. Uh, many times I've had emails from people say, I think my myself or my son, my daughter has SPD because we went to a doctor, uh, I, he can't eat different kind of bread. If he does, he'll gag. Oh, he must have some kind of sensory processing issue with it. And by the end of the session, they're eating all sorts of foods. So it could, couldn't have been sensory processing. It's more of a, a mental block. But the, the protective mechanism looks like a sensory processing issue. You know, I worked with a lady recently whose throat would close up if she tried to eat new foods. Sounds like an allergic response. It's a psychosomatic response, like a placebo. 
after the session she was eating food because now her brain understands, well, if food isn't dangerous, then I guess it can go in. But if I don't trust food, let's close that, that, the entrance. I mean, makes makes a lot of sense. So it's it's not that clear cut what is genuine sensory processing. I'm afraid I only know after therapy. When asked people, are you doing experiments with food? Yes, I'm doing one experiment a day. I'm still struggling with the texture, the taste, even though I'm, I don't know I'll gag or anything, it's still a challenge. So that is that is a, the most challenging form of ARFID. But I don't think it's as wide known and, and common as people are diagnosed. So if you have any questions about this, uh, do post on the comments below and I'll get to them. And if I missed anything, let me know and I'll do a follow-up video. But uh, for now, thank you. And this is answer question, do I have offered with a rough rule of thumb?